What if I told you you're likely leaving a lot of money on the table? Interested in an ROI of six times the average, just leveraging global content creation and a bit of AI? We're uncovering mistakes and supplying strategies for you to gain maximum impact in your campaigns. This is Phraseology plus AI with your hosts, Philippe and Miguel Santos. As a digital marketing professional specializing in SEO for over 20 years, I've worked with companies from startups to the global Fortune 500. Learn how to gain an unfair advantage with AI as we uncover tips, tools, and strategies. Lee Densmer is a dynamic, growth-focused content strategist and owner at Globia, renowned for implementing content programs that amplify audience reach and substantially increase revenue. Her well-structured content marketing approach has achieved six times the ROI compared to other marketing methods. Lee has an exceptionally robust understanding of the language services industry and excels in organizing cha um, chaotic content processes, which I, I think everybody has dealt with at some point. Outside of her professional life at Globia, Lee is a linguist, a world traveler, and an outdoor enthusiast. Highly regarded by peers, Lee's strategic and tactical abilities make her a standout figure in her field. Don't hesitate to contact her for expert tips and content strategy or languages or language services. But with that, I will kind of pass it over to you, Lee, and uh, just feel free to mention anything I might have missed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that great intro. I, I don't think I recognize myself, but I loved it. So I am indeed a content strategist, and I have 23 years in the translation industry. So what I do is global content strategy. What's the content that you need for your home market, but also for other markets. I think we'll get into what that means as we talk, but I'm a content strategist kind of with a twist, the global twist. That's awesome. And I think that's really critical now, especially as we've kind of faced uh, a landscape change with AI. Um, I think between that and the fact that companies have always wanted to go global and sometimes they did, just didn't have the right strategy or needed somebody like you to really dig in. So Lee, discuss the idea that online businesses inherently distribute content globally. And even if they don't plan to, maybe talk about the significance of adapting content for different markets, basically effective distribution. It's a little accidental, but as soon as you go online and start publishing content online, it broadcasts everywhere. So you already have an audience that's everywhere, that's in Asia, that's in Europe, simply because you're online. You don't know who's hitting your website, but a lot of companies don't even think about that. They are targeting their home market. Maybe they start seeing clicks from other countries or likes or customer support requests or action from other countries. And then they're like, oh, we actually have a market in Spain. What do I do about that? And the idea is that you start with a global mindset. You start knowing that when you publish online, you're distributing globally already. And you start thinking about what that might mean in terms of what you create, how you adapt it, where you publish it, because it's different. It's not the same around the world. People don't process content in English in every country. People don't use the same social media cha um, channels in other markets. People don't search in the same way. Search is really different across markets too. So I talk to people about a global at first mindset. And right now, I think a lot of businesses, especially smaller ones, are kind of globally unaware. Makes sense. Yeah, I've worked in a couple of companies where that is the case. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, yeah, there's a huge opportunity. It'll just happen. No, it won't. It needs a little bit of work and a little bit of forethought. So I love that. Right. That's a perfect segue into how can we really explore global distribution then mm -hmm. that's often overlooked in these strategies? Like, how can we actually tackle that? And what, what are some tips or advice that you have about that? Right. So the first thing to do is to understand where your market could be. Where do you want to expand? Where do you really want to focus? Because you don't want to focus, you want to focus on your top value market. And you can know who that is by research, you know, where your product has a chance to do well. And you can look at who is coming to your website, who's interacting with you on social, who's um, logging customer support requests, like where's your activity? and then decide which markets you want to do. And choosing one or two at the start is the best way to go. But then you need to get a handle on the activities and what it means to launch content in that market. And I mentioned translation is the first thing. Changing the words is the only the first thing. 
but it doesn't go deep enough. So what you may need to do is actually adapt your content for that market. Adaptation is often required. And so if you think about American, like I'm American, I write American content. I can't not write American content. But what I write is so rooted in my culture and I don't even know it. So if I'm writing for another culture, I need different images. I need different analogies. I need different references. Here's an example. We use tons of sports analogies in American writing. I hit a home run, touch base. There's a lot of baseball metaphors because we love baseball, but other countries, they're like, I don't even get that reference. So there's a disconnect between what you're creating for your culture and what another culture would want to hear about. It's just a disconnect. And then so your brand isn't connecting in a real way with another culture if you make those choices. So it's about making different choices so that that other market cares about you, connects with you, resonates with you. So the baseball metaphor is a really great example of things you have to look out for when you're writing content for other markets or things that you might need to change. Colors are different around the world. Perceptions of colors. That red in, in Asian countries, I think, in some Asian countries means death or mourning. But a lot of brands in the U.S. use red. Different colors have different connotations in different countries, and you need to be aware of that. Design differs. So Americans like clean websites. But in Asia, if you're adapting your website for another market in Asia, they like, I don't even want to say clutter because to them it's not clutter, but they like very busy websites with a lot of images and a lot of text and a lot going on and that would overwhelm an American consumer. So that's what I mean by adaptation of the content. No, no, I, I love that because it immediately, as funny as it is, made me think of the old like MSN page where it was extremely busy. Uh, but I think that's the kind of experience because it, it provides a lot of information at a glance. Uh, so it kind of depends on the audience, right? It totally depends on the audience, right? And that that felt like more of a news feed than like a landing page or a website, like a shopping website, right? So then when you go to publish that content in, for other markets, it's natural to just try to push it out in the same channels. But like... There's different search engines in use in different countries. There's different social channels that are preferred in different countries. So you need a different social strategy for your target market. You probably need a different promotion strategy. And in a minute, we'll talk about the SEO strategy that, that you need for different markets. And then tell me when you want to get to the funny and terrible examples. Because I have a couple. <laughs> I think we can use that anytime. Early. One example that many people have heard of, there was a San Francisco ad company that was hired to localize the Got Milk campaign. Our Americans in the 90s remember Got Milk, right? In Latin America, they accidentally translated that to, are you lactating? <laughs> I see. How does that work for the market? So that was the first problem is they just translated, they translated the words. They didn't adapt the concept for the culture. Another thing was that the ad campaign is a little bit offensive to Latin American moms and housewives and women because they don't ever have to just run out for milk like Americans do. They've got the milk. They, they're getting it delivered or they already have it because they're better at planning ahead than Americans are. So the go out and get milk concept or are you out of milk concept doesn't land well with that culture. So it was a misstep, and I'm sure that agency got fired. It was a huge mistake. So one more, maybe. There was an airline um, called Braniff, I'm looking at my notes over here, whose big deal was leather seats. Like, we've got leather seats. And that was their, they were trying to appeal to worldwide markets with that. But in Spanish, they translated their logo, their, their tagline was fly in leather, they translated that into Spanish as fly naked. Interesting. Well, that, that's different. Yeah, that's a different kind of airline experience, right? I mean, <laughs> not for everybody. Mistakes like that are all over the place because they're not careful. They're not thinking about the market. They're just translating. And like even worse, if you translate with AI, you're going to get crap like that. Mm -hmm. That's just not well thought out and even, you know, super damaging to the brand. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that too, because that's a perfect uh, segue into the reasoning with AI tools and what, where they could be helpful, right? So I think to your point, it's not ready for prime time 
it's maybe mm -hmm. translating a lot better than it used to. It used to be like right. really strict machine translations. I feel like it's closer to 70, 75% now. So it's much better, but you still need a human to edit it and make sure that the context is right and to ensure that you're not missing certain translated words or, or philosophies or themes. Since AI can't be put back in the bottle, this genie's out. There are ways to use it to speed up your workflow, help your agencies, or if you have in-house uh, talent that's doing translations, understand where they need to go with it, give them some ideas also. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people think about AI and large language models only in terms of trans translation. I'm going to get to other ways to use it in a minute. But yes, large language models can translate. They absolutely can. And for long tail languages like rare languages, it might be like the only shot at getting it done. So AI translation is better than no translation, but it always should be reviewed. And you can of course prompt and train an LLM. So that is recommended, but a human should always review the output. The translation industry has actually been dabbling in AI for like 40 or 50 years. It's just that it's raised in prominence right now because of large language models, but neural machine translation is the most popular and most recent form of AI translation prior to large language models. Doesn't work the same way because large language models predict the next word, but neural machine translation functions on neural networks. Anyway, the log industry has been dabbling in AI for a long time, always backed by humans. Humans are either training the model or reviewing the output, or managing a glossary. AI can do translation quite capably, but it's even better when the words already exist. So checking quality of an existing translation, cleaning up a translation memory. There are ways that you can apply AI to translated content that speeds it up and makes it better. It's much better at working with existing content than generating content from scratch. So that's where we're at right now in the industry is using it on existing content. Another great use case is if you've got a Spanish translation that's for Spain, you can use AI to convert that to a Spanish translation that's appropriate for Puerto Rico or Mexico because it's existing content. You can just ask it to make the change and adapt it. So that's an awesome use case and it's great for that right now, but not for creating from scratch. You kind of mentioned the translation piece. And then mm -hmm. before you were talking a little about the uh, localization part of this. Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of you know, pair those two together? Yeah, I'll explain the difference. So the three concepts I'll explain are translation, transcreation, and localization. So translation is what you know it to be. It's word for word. It's mm -hmm. substitution of this sentence for that one in the new language. It's not creative. Okay, it's a bit mathematical. It's why machines can do it pretty well. Transcreation is a more human process, a creative process where you adapt the message from one concept or emotion or nuance to another. It's more creative. Hard to get a machine to do that. Localization is a deeper dive where you adapt the content, but also it, there's a lot of engineering and testing involved to make sure that your website functions. It's where you get technical. So if, if you're localizing a website or a piece of software, you translate it and you have to engineer it and test it and make sure it functions. So that, that's like the complete job is actual localization. Translation is just this much. Localization is adapting it completely for the market. Yeah. Thank you for breaking that down because that's a critical aspect for people to know and to uh, take in because uh, it is different. And I think a lot of folks sometimes uh, confuse them and don't understand what the, the differences are, but they are critical when you want to have a successful campaign. Uh, given that and the importance of cultural intelligence in global content marketing, how can someone who's listening now take strides and make things happen? Yeah. So the first thing is to be aware that what you're producing is home market content. Just today's a day that you realize what I produce is kind of in my own echo chamber. It's American content because I'm American. So awareness of what it is that you're actually creating. And then the second thing to get a handle on is where are your users or buyers or customers coming from? So that would identify the market that you want to think about next, right? One or two markets. 
Third thing is to understand what localization is. What do you need to do? How complex is it? What does it cost? You need to get a handle on like, the scope of the adaptation. And only then can you really get started on adapting that content for a new market. There are some things to understand. As a lot of companies, I think, don't have the global mindset at the front and they get this far down the path and they're like, oh, we need to go back here. So I would encourage everybody who's listening to start thinking about what it means to be global at the start as early as possible. Really key, really key. Yeah. What are cultural and linguistic factors that you believe the audience uh, need to be aware of? Oh, geez. Okay, I've got an actual list because I do, I'm not able to do this from memory, but I want to be specific. So there are a number of indexes where cultures differ. And a really great book that I'll recommend is called The Culture Map by Erin Meyer. Okay. In it, she talks about ways in which cultures differ. For example, levels of formality. Some cultures are really formal. Some Asian cultures are really formal. The American culture is not. The German culture is somewhere in the middle. So we speak and talk and write informally, especially in IT and software. That like form of talking might not be appropriate for other markets. There are power and hierarchy differentiators across cultures. So in the US, we're pretty democratized. You know, you've got access to the CEO, everybody talks to everybody, but in other cultures, there's a power dynamic that's part of their culture that you need to be aware of. Different religions are different from culture to culture. Family structures and how genders are viewed are different from culture to culture. Once you start to study it and learn about it, you're like, wow, I'll be darned. Those who travel start to understand how different cultures really can be. And it's fascinating, but all those differences mean you need to take a different approach to marketing to that culture. You need to understand the differences that are culture and adapt your approach. So, and that's why you pay somebody to help you because none of us is an expert. There's plenty of bicultural people. I'm not one of them. You're probably closer to it than me. I was born in Peru. I speak Spanish. I'm definitely not Peruvian. So most of us don't understand another culture very well. And you don't even understand your own culture very well because you're in it every day. And then when you start learning about culture, you're, you're, it's always kind of a fascinating shocker. Wait, what? I think that's why travel is so like, so fun. People just love travel and it's fun. Yeah. Because it just yeah. takes you out of your element. Businesses should always be there, right? Sure. That's why I recommended that culture map. It's Aaron Meyer. It gives a good overview of what I'm talking about. There's lots of examples about how teams failed to integrate because they misunderstood culture problems that they overcame and how they overcame them just by learning about the cultural differences that I explained. Now, I imagine the cultural differences are extreme based on where you go. But I'd love to also <laughs> cross an additional complexity, which is how do you feel AI and its role could be used in this content creation and adaption for global markets. How can we take the benefits of what we have now and apply mm -hmm. them? AI and culture. So we've already talked about how AI can help with actually getting translation done and actually um, converting from one language to another. And AI is also good in helping with some workflow automations. But as far as the cultural stuff, I think AI can be helpful to research buyers and to research, to provide research on cultures. It can aggregate research. It can draw conclusions from research. It may even be able to give you some insight on how to adapt something for another culture based on that research. I use AI for research all the time, and it crosses my mind that that's probably the most powerful use case here is to use it to aggregate research about how a buyer in Japan of this demographic may perceive this or that or what you need to know kind of information, aggregating that information. And then a, a human, a strategist would need to extrapolate how to apply that knowledge to content, to a website or whatever. Do you have any like favorite tools? I, I mean, I'm pretty agnostic, but maybe there are some better tools to do the research. Right. I pay for ChatGPT. That's the only one I pay for. I like perplexity a lot. It just, I use them all. I kind of interchange between them. And I like Gemini too, because Gemini quickly searches the internet and scrapes anything it needs to, to, to bring you your conclusions or your research. So I use those three tools. 
perplexity, Gemini. And you know what? I just heard a podcast. I'll recommend this podcast for AI enthusiasts. It's a different format than yours. It's like news bites and it's called the neuron. So it's this guy, Pete, who gives you like news bites. So what's going on every day? Anyway, he was talking the other day about Llama, which is Meta's new AI tool. And he says it's better than all the rest. So I'm curious about this tool. And it's showing up on Facebook. There's like showing up in Meta's tools. There's, there are buttons now on Facebook that you can click to access this Llama that's supposed to be the best out there. It's almost like every week there's a better LLM or a better version, but yeah, I have heard some things about Llama, the new version of it, and I haven't tried it out yet, but I'm keen to. It's very, very interesting. So you spend your Saturday fiddling with LLMs and just lose your day. That'd be easy to do. <laughs> Absolutely. But in this case, we'll kind of pull that out for everyone else and then give them perspective. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it's good to have news because things are changing constantly, Absolutely. but it's also like from the, the sake of this podcast and others that are experts speaking about this, it's really about giving people the tools that they need to succeed at uh, overcoming what we know as change because change is inevitable. I meet three types of people, right? I meet people who are AI enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. We like talking about it. We listen to podcasts on it. We mess around with tools. I meet people who are AI resistant. They don't really see how it can benefit their work, don't trust it. So there's the early adopters, maybe people like us, and then there's the resistors. Because too much funny people were someone in the middle. But it's interesting to talk because some people light up. They're like, I love it. Tell me more. And some people are like, oh, not this again. Yeah, I kind of feel like you're completely right of that. I feel like history repeats itself, though. So the funny thing is, mm -hmm. I'm sure this happened when the cars came on from the mm -hmm. horse and buggy. I'm pretty yeah. sure this happened when we started getting mobile phones. It's like, oh my God, we're going to fry our brains with this new technology. Mm -hmm. So we can see that that stuff hasn't really panned out. But the fear now is that we've had these movies and still like Terminator where the robots are out to get us. And this is AI, right? So I think it's there's a fear for those that are hesitating. There's the mm -hmm. enthusiasts like us just figure that, hey, I might as well be the first or one of the first ones to get into it so that I can understand it and so I'm not scared of it. And everybody else in the middle is just trying to figure out like, hey, where am I? Where am yeah. I in this compass? Like, where's the compass pointing me? And that's fine. It's fine to be in that kind of, it's a messy middle right now. It's messy. Mm -hmm. It's fine to be there and keep your ears open and be willing to learn. The, the bottom line is that every one of us knowledge workers, we're knowledge workers, wow. has to upskill. You've got to upskill. You've got to keep studying and learning and figuring out how to apply it in your work. It's just going to make you faster and more valuable to your employers. And there's, there's, I don't really see any other choice. I'm with you. I think those that are lifelong learners definitely do better. And we also feel more satisfied with things because we have at least a little bit of control, right? If you take that control away, then you become one of those that might be fearing everything because it's obvious it's being enacted on you, right? Rather than you kind of grabbing the rein on certain things. So I think that's a really healthy attitude. I appreciate that. I'd love to kind of get from you, like what you feel the beneficial aspects of artificial intelligence are right now. I know we talked a little bit about this, but getting into some of the benefits and some of the caveats or potential pitfalls of AI driven content strategies, because you're all in this. Yeah, I am using right now AI more for execution than for strategy. However, so by that, I mean researching, giving me title ideas, giving me topic ideas, giving me alternate ways to phrase things. However, there are ways that you can use it for content strategy, like buyer persona research is absolutely content strategy. Trying to extrapolate the top 20 things that a certain buyer cares about is strategy. So you can ask an LLM by, by prompting it with who your buyer is to give you insights about that buyer. That is strategy. Still a content strategist or a global content strategist will never be replaced. There still has to be somebody to do that prompting and gathering and then apply it. But I think the best content strategists and writers right now are, are using AI to inform their strategy. It's so much faster. It is. It is. <laughs> So much. I mean, you can use AI to write a creative brief. You can use it to plan a content calendar. And I'm not going to tell you that it's done. It's one and done. You, you've got something that you can use and refine and fix and tweak to, to come out with something good. I would never build a strategy with AI and then hand it over. 
definitely. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. And and I and I think that that level of responsibility that I feel maybe differentiates me and people like us as a professional. Because yes, I'm using AI. I feel like I have to. I feel like you want me to. But it's not all there is to it. I'm not about ready to let go. And, and I'm with you. Like the, there was a lot of hype around prompt engineering for a good reason. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get the best output from the first time, especially if you don't really understand how to give it full context of what you expect as the output. I guess even that the term garbage in, garbage out has been here forever. And it's right. the same concept. You give it garbage, you get garbage. If you give it more context and better examples, it understands a little bit more how to uh, deliver something that you actually want. So right. yeah, absolutely there with you. And now ChatGPT4 has a memory toggle. You can tell it to remember things. Um, like for example, you tell it to remember a certain buyer persona and then it remembers everything that you've told it to. So that is just an example of how to use the tool um, to refine the tool for your purposes. And what's crazy, what's happening in the background is that everything that you've chatted with in, in terms of its transcript is being fed back to it every single time. Right. <laughs> it, like, it feels like, kind of dumb, right? <laughs> yeah, like it's like a baby. It knows nothing until you wake it up and then it has to learn everything. Yeah, Again, like from the it. from the user perspective, it's easy, right? It, it yeah. like we don't see all that. No. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about SEO again. Maybe any insights that you've had for SEO as a global distribution channel and maybe the importance of that with multilingual search optimization. Like right. what have you experienced? What I've experienced is that a lot of companies who are aware of the need to adapt their content just translate their keywords and then use those translations. Either they translate the content and hope the keywords have carried over or they Never. translate the They'll just say that either way gets you the same result because search behavior differs across the world in different countries. Search terms differ. You know, here's an English to English example. If I use the search term sweater in content for a UK audience, they don't say sweater. They say jumper to, mm -hmm. to mean like something like what I'm wearing. So you have to do your SEO strategic research in that market for that market. There, there is no one-to-one correspondence. You, you start over for the new market with your SEO keyword research and strategy. And so you need to do that for a foreign language as well. You need to research in that market in Spain, how people search for sweaters, pick the right word and optimize for that word. What are keywords? Share with me the top 10 keywords that have high volume and low di difficulty, for example. Suggest to me 40 keywords that are related to this seed term. You can do that in other languages. I never played around with a large language model in Spanish, but that would be interesting. I have only ever played with it in English. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I, I, yeah, I played with it a little bit and I think it's interesting. You can create your own small version or small model in a language. Have I gone deep into it? No, but have I tried a couple? Yes. And I think it's, it really depends on how it's trained. Obviously there's a lot that's left to be desired, but yes, if you're looking for some advantages in terms of being able to get over some kind of bottleneck or block, it's really helpful, but th there's a lot of editing and there's a lot of verifying and checking that you need to do. And th luckily I have friends uh, that speak a lot of different languages. So to me, I can just kind of shop it over to them and say, Hey, how does this look? Give me a percentage Is it, out of a hundred, how much? So it's very helpful to have that. <laughs> the friends who speak other languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you need that. I think every company needs that, but they probably pay them. So it's a little different. I hope so, yeah. <laughs>
But the idea is that you write in such a generic way that everybody in the world who speaks English can understand it. And it translates super easily everywhere because it's so generic. That is not the way I would go. Not if you really want to embed a market. I would create English content that's appropriate for your market. And then like we talked about, adapt it for your other markets, whether you need to translate it or not. I mean, obviously for the UK, you're not actually translating the English, you're adapting it. Yeah. So all that to say an awareness of what it means what it means, what content means and should mean for different cultures and the different ways that you need to adapt it for that market. It's a lot of education and awareness up front before you can do a thing, you need to understand what's going on. So we take that into mind and like anything, the quality that you put in, the time that you take to devise a good strategy and then thinking about your markets and your I guess the profile of the audience a little bit better gives you a, a, a template, right? To work with. So I guess what actionable steps would you say people should follow to initiate these efforts and to truly make it part of their DNA? Right. I mentioned understanding where your customers, your users or people are coming from. So looking at the data to understand where your potential markets are. Understanding all the steps involved in adaptation and understanding what they cost. You can't get any work done unless you understand the amount of time it's going to take, how much it's going to cost, what the actual effort is. So that I highly encourage companies that are serious about selling globally to engage a, a professional group. They're called language services providers. They run from small mom and pop shops to mega companies that are selling $750 million of this, but that can help you figure out what you really need to do to get your content set for another market. Yeah. I love how you also like previously mentioned the global English aspect, because it is really funny how we use these phrases every day in our communication, but others like in Australia, New Zealand. India, India, like, they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> and likewise, and, like, yeah. yeah. It gets even worse when you translate it. Let's translate something that's already incomprehensible and hope for the best. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of those like imaginary languages that kids uh, used to have between, uh, between themselves, you know, like trying to come up with a whole new language uh, that's gibberish. Yeah. That's funny. We have two more bad examples. Do you want them? Oh yes, please. <laughs> Pepsi used to have a slogan, come alive with the Pepsi generation. So come alive. They translated that into Chinese as Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the graves. Okay. I mean, if Pepsi can do that, then what can Coke do? Interesting. I don't know what you wonder. That missed the mark. And then another one is Kentucky Fried Chicken. If you've traveled, you've seen Kentucky Fried Chicken. We were just in Vietnam and there was Kentucky Fried Chicken, which I don't even need at home, but apparently it's big in Asia. But for China, they translated finger licking good to eat your fingers off. Yeah, that's a great translation. But think about it. Not all cultures lick their fingers. It's kind of gross. It's gross in our culture, but you, we all understand that to mean it was so good you licked your fingers. Well, too weird for other cultures. And then you translate it just like, it's written and you get something like eat your fingers off. It just goes from weird to bizarre. <laughs> I love yeah. that example. And, and it reminds me, I think of, was it Burger King that had the black mm -hmm. burger? It was all black. Oh, um, and in certain places, like obviously here, we were like, what? <laughs> what is it made of? Why is it like all black? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's cool, but like, is it is it cancer inducing? Like, Like, these are the kind of questions that come up. But in other places, it was like, fantastic. It's like, this is something new. So really beyond just the uh, linguistic aspects of it, it's also like yeah. the product itself has to like be made for the culture. Exactly. So interesting about Starbucks and about Subway too. A friend of mine here where I live is the localization manager at Subway. Mm -hmm. So both companies, Subway and Starbucks have adapted their menu and put things on their menu that are specific for local cultures. So like in Vietnam, Subway has a sandwich that's like banh mi. It's like the Vietnamese national sandwich which you could never get in the U.S., but they have to offer they have to offer that in Vietnam because that's what the culture wants and that's what helped the company succeed in Vietnam. 
And same with Starbucks, you know, you're going to get a mango latte in Bali that you can't get here. Uh, now I kind of want one. <laughs> How does that sound? Yeah. Um, so uh, localization and changing products and content for other cultures is actually really interesting. It's, it's subtle, it's nuanced, it's tricky, it's easy to get it wrong. It's super expensive when you get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that gives it so much more personality. <laughs> Getting wrong. Like, I'm sure that the Dairy Men's Association isn't very happy about the are you lactating fiasco. Have to spend money to make money. <laughs> yeah. That's taken yeah. the wrong way. Completely the wrong way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, Lee, uh, are there any specific tools or like resources that you encourage mm -hmm. some of the listeners to, to use or adapt? I mean, we talked about obviously chat GPT. Are there any like specific tools or th or ways that you've kind of gone about tracking the, the global content, like using global content, maybe tools that are very niche that you want to mention? Not really. I mean, we could get into software localization tools and all that. What I think I would point these listeners to is a resource called NIMSI and that's spelled N-I-M-D-Z-I. And they provide a lot of research and articles and blog posts on what I'm talking about, the different aspects of taking content global. And there's a book, I love books, by a woman named Natalie Kelly. And Natalie's an expert in going global. And her book is called Take Your Company Global. So that is a really good book and a really good resource. It has some culture stuff too. I recommend that book for anybody who's interested in what I'm talking about here. Excellent suggestions. And, and like you said, it, it may be good to know about some of those localization softwares, but it's probably better to understand, generally speaking, how to think about it, because then you can find the tool that fits you best. Right. Yeah. Yes. And and there are tools that put all the translations in and leverage past translations. So it plugs the old good stuff right in. And there's tools that automate the quality assurance. There's tools that pull and push content from an enterprise's content management system. So there's the corpus of workflow and automation tools that make high volumes of content really easy to manage. Amazing. Wow. I, I really appreciate you like sharing your expertise and kind of walking fo folks through this. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we draw the curtains mm -hmm. on this enlightening conversation with Lee Denver, it's evident that the landscape of global content marketing is undergoing a seismic shift regarding the age of AI. From decoding these algorithms to crafting compelling na narratives, Lee has left us with invaluable insights in navigating this dynamic realm. To stay connected with her and to know what's going on in the world of content marketing, especially as artificial intelligence becomes more familiar, I would employ you to follow her and check out her LinkedIn and Twitter. I would actually pass it to you to mention anything that you'd like to mention, Lee. Sure. I am on LinkedIn. I'm active on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. I'm the only Lee Densmer, so I shouldn't be hard to find. And I do post every day and I respond to direct messages if you have any questions about that. Awesome. <laughs> well, with that, until next time, remember, in this ever-evolving digital yeah. sphere, adaptation is key and the possibilities are limitless. Thank you, mm -hmm. Lee. Sure. My pleasure. 